The bound states for the finite square well potential are discussed in another lecture. The subject of this lecture is the scattering states for the finite square well, which can be derived in a very similar way. The overall context is our finite square well potential, a potential V of x that's defined to be 0 for x less than minus a, 0 for x greater than a, and a constant minus V naught for x is in between minus a and a. So this is an even potential, and we exploited that fact when we were discussing the bound states, states where the energy is negative, to figure out what, the, what those states look like. And the lowest energy bound state that we found ended up looking something like this. Smoothly joining the axis as x becomes, becomes large and negative, smoothly joining the axis for x becomes large and positive, and a smooth curve in between minus a and a inside the well. We found this by examining the general solution for regions less than minus a, between minus a and a, and greater than a, and smoothly matching those piecewise defined solutions together with the boundary conditions for the Schrodinger equation. We're going to take a very similar approach here, except instead this time we seek scattering state solutions, where the energy E is everywhere above the potential, and as a result our solution can extend all the way from minus infinity to plus infinity. The solutions that we get will end up looking a little something like this, but we'll see what they look like uh, momentarily. Given this potential, we're looking at three distinct regions, and we're trying to solve our Schrodinger equation over those regions. Our Schrodinger equation, as always, is minus h bar squared over 2m, second derivative of psi, with respect to x, plus v of x psi is equal to e times psi. Now we know away from our discontinuities, v of x is going to be a constant, so we expect the overall properties of this solution to be relatively straightforward. And indeed they are. Our three regions are divided by x equals minus a and x equals a. For x is less than minus a, our potential here is going to be defined to be 0. And our Schrodinger equation then simplifies to something of the form second partial derivative of psi with respect to x is equal to minus k squared psi, where k is defined as, for instance, in the case of the free particle, as 2me over h bar squared, k squared, excuse me, k squared is 2me over h bar squared. We know the solution to this case for the free particle gave us traveling waves, and we're going to reuse that form of our solution here. We'll have psi being equal to a e to the i kx plus b e to the minus i kx. Traveling waves moving to the right and traveling waves moving to the left. Of course, nothing is traveling about this now, since we're just looking at solutions to the time-independent Schrodinger equation. But if you, as before, add the time dependence to these solutions, you find that they are indeed traveling waves. That was for the region where x is less than minus a. The region where x is greater than minus a is going to give us something very similar. It's going to give us an exactly identical Schrodinger equation, and it's going to give us exactly identical solutions except we'll be working with slightly different constants. Our wave function psi is going to be given by, in this case I'll call it f e to the i k x plus g e to the minus i k x. Now I've used a different constants for f and g, but the same constant for k, since overall we're trying to solve the same Schrodinger equation, so we have effectively the same value for e, and therefore the same value for k, as defined in terms of 2me over h bar squared. For the region in between minus a and plus a, we're going to have a slightly different Schrodinger equation. It's going to give us essentially the same sorts of solution, though, but I'm going to write them slightly differently. Our overall Schrodinger equation will become, as before, the second derivative of psi is equal to minus some constant times psi, but the constant is going to be different. The constant, instead of being 2me over h-bar, is going to be 2m over h-bar squared times e minus v, e minus v naught, but since, or sorry, e minus v of x, let me step this out a little bit, e minus v of x, since v of x uh, in the region between minus a and a is minus v naught, this is effectively e plus v naught. So we have our constants here, and in the case of these solutions, 
We could easily write them in terms of traveling waves with L instead of K, but it's actually slightly easier here to write them instead in terms of sines and cosines. This is just as general a solution, but let's write psi in this regime as C times the sine of Lx plus D times the cosine of Lx. Apologies for being messy here. These are then our three general solutions. We can call them psi1, psi2, and psi3, if you like. But these are general solutions to the Schrodinger equation, the time-independent Schrodinger equation, for these three regions. The next step is to mesh these solutions together with our boundary conditions. And we had two boundary conditions, and if you're unfamiliar with the boundary conditions that we'll be using under these circumstances, I suggest you go back and examine the lecture on boundary conditions. The first of our boundary conditions was that the wave function is continuous, and the second was that the first derivative of the wave function is continuous. And there are sound physical reasons that those that, that has to be the case. For instance, if the wave function itself is discontinuous, the expectation value for the kinetic energy of the wave function diverges to infinity and cannot be a physical state. But, considering the boundary at x equals minus a, ensuring that the boundary condition holds means meshing the value of this wave function at minus a and the value of this wave function at minus a. <coughs> Excuse me. So, let's go ahead and plug that in. Our boundary condition at minus a here uh, is going to give us a e to the minus i kx plus b e to the i kx, oh, sorry, not x, we're plugging in for x, minus i k a, and then b e to the i k a, since I'm substituting in minus a for x. That's what I get for this region. That has to be equal to what I get for this region which in this case I will write as minus C sine LA plus D cosine LA. Now if I substitute in minus A for X here, I would actually get the sine of minus LA, but since sine is an odd function, I'm pulling the minus sign out front and writing this as minus C times the sine of LA, just to keep the arguments inside all of the trig functions consistent. So this is our boundary condition for the continuity of psi, we have another boundary condition for the first derivative of psi, and you can write that down more or less just as easily by noting that in either of these cases, taking the first derivative with respect to x is going to bring down an ik. So we'll end up with ik times the quantity a e to the minus ika plus b e to the ika, and I've screwed up the minus signs already, since the uh, sign here is going to bring down a minus ik, when I factor out the ik, I'll still be left with the minus sign. So that's our first derivative of the wave function in this region. And if we're going to ensure continuity of the first derivative, we must also equal the first derivative of this wave function evaluated at the boundary. Taking the first derivative of sine and of cosine is going to pull out an L, so I'm going to have something that looks similar. I'm going to have L times a quantity, then the derivative of sine is cosine, C cosine, LA. And the derivative of cosine is minus sine. So I'm going to have minus D sine. And I'm evaluating it at minus LA again, which I'm going to use to cancel out this minus sign. Sine of minus an argument is minus the sine of the argument. So I have two minus signs, and I end up with a plus overall. So these are our boundary conditions at x equals minus a. We get very similar expressions for our boundary conditions at plus a, but before I write them down, I'm going to make an additional simplification. Since what we're considering here are scattering states, for instance, in our, consider in our consideration of the scattering of uh, scattering states <laughs> off of a delta function potential, we had a wave incident from the left a wave bouncing back to the left, and we had a wave that was transmitted through. That was for a single potential. If we have some potential well, we're still probably interested in the same sort of process, a wave incident from the left, a wave scattering back to the left, and a wave transmitted through to the right. 
we're probably not so concerned with the wave coming in from the right, so I'm going to get rid of that one, and that amounts to setting g equal to zero on, for our general solution in this regime. So we're no longer working with a fully general solution, but we have one fewer unknown to work with since we've gotten rid of g, which simplifies the algebra uh, quite a lot. Makes it solvable, in fact. So, going through the same procedure we did at minus a, instead evaluating the wave function and its first derivative at a, the expressions we get are c sine la plus d cosine la is equal to f e to the i k a. That's from discontinuity, plugging in x equals a into this expression and setting it equal to plugging x equals a into this expression. Our first derivative, again, by taking the first derivative and repeating the process, gives you L times C cosine, C times the cosine of LA minus, now, D times the sine of LA. We have a minus sign here because now we get the minus sign from taking the derivative of cosine, and we're substituting in plus A, so what I did to get a plus sign here no longer works. I can't factor a minus sign out. That's our left-hand side, and it's going to be equal to, first derivative of this brings down an i k, as before, i k f e to the i k a. So those are our general boundary conditions, and we have essentially five equations and four unknowns here. We have a, b, c, d, f, and k, all being unknown. k is determined entirely by the energy. And since what we're working with here are scattering states, we can treat the energy as something that we, the experimenters, control. But we still have these four unknowns, A, B, C, D, and F. Sorry, yes, five unknowns, A, B, C, D, and F, to take care of. As before, we can express reflection and transmission coefficients, sorry, in terms of these boundary condition expressions. The overall procedure is to essentially solve this system. Use these two equations to eliminate C and D in these equations. And what we'll be left with then is equations involving A and F. Sorry, A, B, and F. I always forget about B. By using these two equations, you can, manipulate, you can uh, eliminate B and just get an equation with A and F. These are the same sorts of operations you are familiar with from solving systems of equations. What you end up with, for instance, solving for F in terms of A, is messy, unfortunately. But F comes out to be equal to E to the 2i k A times capital A all over cosine of 2LA minus I K squared plus L squared over 2KL, and the I here, to make it clear, is outside. And this term is multiplied by sine of 2LA. So this is what you would get from solving the system of equations, and it gives you F in terms of A. Now, as before, if we're interested in a transmission coefficient, t, t is usually defined to be the magnitude squared of f divided by the magnitude squared of a, the amplitude of the outgoing wave divided by the amplitude of the incoming wave. And if we don't really care about the relative phases of those two waves, the transmission coefficient, t, encapsulates all the information that we could want. If you make this manipulation, dividing by a to get it over on the left-hand side, taking the squared absolute magnitude of this rather ugly expression, what you get for t is 1 over 1 plus v naught squared, your potential well depth, over 4e times e plus v naught times sine squared of 2a over h bar 
square root of 2m e plus v naught. Close parentheses, close my sign, everything's still in the denominator. This is your expression for the transmission coefficient that you get by solving the system of equations and making the appropriate manipulations, finding absolute magnitudes and squaring them and the like. What this transmission coefficient actually looks like as a function now of the energy of the incident particle is a little strange. For very low energy incident particles, you get very low transmission. This is a little strange. A particle with low energy coming in towards a potential well is not likely to be transmitted. This is unlike the classical case where a cart rolling towards a dip picks up speed and then loses it again as it climbs the hill on the other side. It's unlikely to be reflected. In the classical case, you would have never have any reflection from a potential well. In this case, however, we do have reflection because we have less than perfect transmission. And as before, we need r plus t equal to 1. As the energy of the particle increases, the probability of transmission, the squared amplitude of the wave function that passes the well, increases until it reaches 100%. That's a little strange. We have perfect transmission here. Zero reflection. What's even stranger about this transmission coefficient is that as the energy continues to increase, we stop having perfect transmission, actually go back down to quite a poor level of transmission, depending on the well, on the depth and on the width of the well and the mass of the particle and the energy with which it's entering. As the energy increases, we come back again towards perfect transmission. Energy continues to increase, we lose our perfect transmission. Again, we get to perfect transmission, and again, and again, etc. So, our transmission coefficient actually has uh, some interesting properties here, and you can think about this as analogous to, for instance, anti-reflection coating in uh, optics. If you have a lens and you don't want any reflections, you can think of it, think of putting a coating on the lens that results in perfect transmission for the particular energies of incident particles, for instance, the particular wavelengths of light that you're interested in. So there's some interesting properties here, and it all came as a result of looking at the general solutions to the Schrodinger equation and applying boundary conditions to mesh those solutions together, and then manipulating those boundary conditions. I have not actually written what the solutions to the time-independent Schrodinger equation are, what these traveling wave states that come in from the left mesh with solutions in the well and go off to the right, I haven't written what those solutions actually look like, but I have described properties here, for instance, of the solutions. This is characteristic of the sorts of calculations you want to do in quantum mechanics. If you don't have to work with the wave function itself, avoid it, because wave functions tend to be difficult and don't give you perfect information anyway. And the aggregate properties, things like uh, the transmission coefficient in this case, uh, can in some cases be derived without knowledge of the full details of the wave function. That's about it. To check your understanding, go back and look at that definition of the transmission coefficient and figure out what values the energy has where we get zero reflection. Those perfect transmission values have a nice interpretation in terms of the behavior of the infinite square well, so look at those energies and figure out where they happen in the context of the energies of infinite square well states.